Okay. So here's chapter 10 on our muscles. And you'll kind of see in a little bit as we're going through this, uh, we need to shut that video off. I can't look at myself. There we go. Bye-bye. All right. So a couple things about muscles. We know it is one of the types of tissue in your body. Remember, there's four types of tissue in your body. You've got our epithelial tissue, connective tissue, muscle tissue, and nervous tissue. We have covered all the other tissues, okay, except for muscle tissue. And so now we are going to go ahead and do that. And so today, we're going to give a nice brief introduction into our muscle tissue. All right, so keep in mind, all right, I've said it in the past about muscle tissue is when you think of muscle, think of movement. Muscle is a tissue that is going to move things. And so we see it all throughout our body. Right? We've seen it in our skin, uh, our smooth muscle, the erector pili muscle, which helps to um, uh, elevate the hair follicle right? through sympathetic stimulation or when you're very cold. We've seen skeletal muscle, or actually we will see skeletal muscle in this chapter, all right, move the body. And, and we're going to talk about some of the other functions. And then there's cardiac muscle. Right, the muscle is only found in one place in the heart that is going to actually move blood throughout our cardiovascular system. And its job is real simple to beat and pump the blood. So when we're talking about some of the functions here of muscles, right, obviously we're going to see movement. So for the, some of the examples that we talk about, right, moving food through our GI tract. All right, that's going to be the role of our smooth muscle throughout the entire GI tract. Also, we'll see some skeletal muscle in there, okay, especially during the voluntary phase of when you're chewing and swallowing, okay. Uh, we'll also see when we're discussing the movement, you'll see it more uh, in 211, all right, about uh, the changes in air all right, that are going to move in and out of the lungs. Uh, the diaphragm, we talked about that in, in our axial uh, muscles there. How when that muscle contracts, it's going to allow for the movement of air into the thoracic cavity. And then our cardiac muscle is going to pump blood throughout our body to all the different body tissues. So there's three types. We have skeletal muscle that's voluntary. We have our cardiac and smooth muscle. Those are both involuntary. Right? Our muscle makes up close in an adult person, close to 50% of your body weight. That's pretty impressive. And we're discussing all the different types of muscle, not just skeletal muscle, but cardiac muscle and smooth muscle. Now we're fortunate in this class and in this course that we don't have you learn every single skeletal muscle. And as you notice, there's about 700 different skeletal muscles in our body. All right now, it probably feels like you're learning about 700 different muscles here, right? but we're not having you learn all 700, okay? So some of the functions of skeletal muscle, that's where we're gonna be focusing a lot at the beginning of this chapter is skeletal muscle. So overall body movement, all right? We saw when we were studying the axial muscles, how some of those muscles could express facial expressions, right? We also talked about how, what muscles are involved in actual respiration. I'm using some of my skeletal muscle right now to speak to you folks and actually pronouncing and phonicating words to you folks. And then of course, the obvious role of skeletal muscle is to move the body, all right? Because muscles attach onto the bones, and the bones act as levers, and so we get our movement. You're utilizing your skeletal muscle right now, if you, at least if you're sitting up or standing while you're listening to me talk, because it allows us for maintenance of body posture. Okay? For me to sit here and talk to you, I'm um, engaging and contracting my skeletal muscle in my trunk to keep me upright, especially if I'm standing. One of the other things too, we'll notice, especially for any of you that have had to do any type of physical therapy and they're trying to help with muscle strength, we see it, especially in folks that are rehabbing, um, in, not injuries, but like knee replacements, for example, a lot of the PT, uh, the physical therapists there um, strongly encourage people to exercise the muscles in and around the knee to strengthen and stabilize that joint. Protection and support. Right? Not all of our organs are protected by bone, okay? Some are, very fortunate, okay? But others are not. And so a lot of, this, several of the organs in your abdomen are not protected all right, by bone. Uh, just uh, look at Harry Houdini. Uh, that gentleman, he uh, had very, very well-defined core muscles, very strong. A lot of it was just what he did for a living. Also some genetics played a role in that. But 
he used to have this contest in which he would let people go ahead and punch him in the stomach. And kind of an odd thing, but he was very proud of the fact that he had very strong abdominal muscles. And um, one of the things that did him in was he allowed a gentleman to punch him in the stomach and he was not ready for it. And before he could contract and, and tighten all of his abdominal muscles, the man uh, hit him and ruptured his spleen. Crazy part is he let the same guy hit him again right afterwards when he was ready. But by then the damage was uh, too late and uh, ruptured spleen and he eventually died. Uh, regulation and elimination of materials. All I can say is toilet training for that, right? You learn how to regulate and control muscles when you're potty training for your sphincters uh, for the anus, all right? The external anal sphincter and your uh, external um, urinary sphincter. And that is skeletal muscle. And so when you are, learn how to control that, then you actually are able to learn how to regulate the elimination of wastes, urine and feces, all right? And then of course we learned about how it functions with heat production when you start to shiver. All right, so what are the five major functions of skeletal muscle? There you go, body movement, maintenance and posture, protection and support, storage and movement of material and heat production. So those are the functions. Let's talk about some of the characteristics of skeletal muscle tissue. Now, you might notice when you're looking at the screen here that the first two characteristics look very, very similar to the nervous tissue characteristics, and you'd be correct, right? So that's why one of the reasons why we learn chapter 12 first and then come to chapter 10, right? Because if you understand how we're able to generate an action potential, we're gonna apply some of those same principles to skeletal muscle. So yes, yeah, skeletal muscle is excitable. That means it has to be able to respond to a stimulus by changing the electrical membrane potential. That's that, remember our resting membrane potential in a neuron? Well, guess what? We have a resting membrane potential in our skeletal muscle, and then we generate an action potential, and hopefully we can actually cause a muscle contraction once we change the electrical membrane potential on our um, plasma membrane of our muscle cell. Now, similar to how a neuron had to conduct the signal down the axon, right, we're gonna see how we need to conduct a signal, an action potential down the plasma membrane of our skeletal muscle and eventually uh, cause a contraction. So that's our conductivity. Contractility is when we actually achieve our goal of getting the muscle to contract. So what will happen is we, we've reached our threshold, we can initiate a muscle contraction and when we initiate a muscle contraction, we're going to talk about our contractile filaments, right? These uh, thin and thick filaments, they're proteins, right? That are going to slide past each other. And as they're sliding past each other, they're going to create the contraction which elicits muscle movement. Then we have extensibility, right? If you've ever noticed, all right? Usually when you engage in some sort of physical activity, especially if it was in physical education class, right? your instructor may have wanted you to stretch out. And so they were actually testing the characteristic of skeletal muscles extensibility, the ability now for us to stretch that tissue, right, specifically the cell, in, in uh, causing it to lengthen in its length. Finally, there's elasticity, okay? Just like with any type of elasticity uh, concept that we've learned this semester, right, we're gonna see when we change the shape, all right, of whatever it is that we're looking at, we're gonna test its ability to return to its original shape or length. And that's what we're gonna see with skeletal muscle, right? Once we contract it, okay, its ability to return back to its original length. Or if we uh, lengthen it, its ability to return back to its original uh, length too after we've stretched it. So when, when we were talking about that characteristic, we were referring to its elasticity. So back in chapter seven, I didn't mention that the organs of the skeletal system are the bones. Well, the organs of our skeletal, of our muscle, uh, of our skeletal muscle is gonna actually be the skeletal muscle tissue. And so that's gonna be our organ. And, and we've discussed how certain organs are going to have more than just one tissue type. And we're gonna learn that we're going to see in skeletal muscle that yes, it's just more than the skeletal muscle fiber. We're gonna see some connective tissue there. And then of course, we need to supply that connective tissue and the skeletal tissue with nutrients to get rid of their waste. So we need blood vessels. And then of course we need nerves to get this whole system rolling, okay? We need to stimulate 
all right, this tissue. And so the nerves are going to do that. So let's break down the gross anatomy of our skeletal muscle tissue. All right, so we have the whole muscle. So we've learned some of these muscles, all right, like rectus abdominis or orbicularis oris, external fibers. Right? So that's the entirety of the muscle. And so when we were talking about some of these configurations of the muscle, remember we were talking about the muscle patterns, like some are going to be circular, some are going to be pennate, some are going to be parallel fibers. And I was telling you what gives it, uh, when we're talking about the pattern organization, we're referring to the fascicles. And so now we get to go into a little bit more depth about what a fascicle is. And that's when we've taken a group of muscle fibers and we just group them together. And we're going to wrap some connective tissue around that. We'll talk about that in a moment here. All right, but when we're looking at these muscles, like our rectus abdominis muscle or the frontalis muscle, right, we're going to see that these muscles are, are made up of many, many fascicles. And so these fascicles, we've taken these muscle fibers or what we call myofibers, fibers, and we wrap them up. And that's what a muscle fiber is. It's a muscle cell, right? We also call it a myofiber. And so what we've done is, all right, we have actually, similar to the nerves, we wrap our muscles up and parts of these muscles up in connective tissue. So I'm going to start from the outside in, or excuse me, the outside and work my way in, all right, with these three, all right, layers of connective tissue. Right. And their job is to protect the muscle tissue. So the outermost layer is the epimyosin. And that's going to, and you probably see a pattern here because we saw that same thing in the nervous system. It's made up of dense irregular connective tissue. And that wraps around the whole muscle itself. Then, all right, remember what I said, these whole muscles are made up of these fascicles. So these fascicles, which are many muscle fibers, all right, we, we bundle together. And so we put a wrapping around that. And that's also going to be made up of dense irregular connective tissue. And that's our perimyosin. Now, here in the perimy perimyosin, you will see some blood vessels and nerves. And then the innermost layer, right? Another similarity to nervous tissue, right? Um, the innermost layer, the endomyosin, is wrapped in a loose connective tissue, areolar connective tissue. And that wraps around each individual muscle fiber, each individual cell. And so this is important because it's also going to contribute to electrical insulation like we saw with our neurons, right? With the endoneurium. All right, one of its roles was electrical insulation for the endoneurium. Well, same thing here with the endomycin. All right, we're going to see electrical insulation along with some blood vessels or capillaries. All right, so we're going to see some similarities between our nervous tissue and our muscle tissue in that regard. So here you can see our nice picture here right, of our muscle tissue. All right, so here's our muscle, the whole muscle. We wrap it up. All right, in our epimyosin. And then we'll notice when we take a closer look at our muscle tissue, it's made up of all these bundles. And those bundles are individually wrapped with the perimyosin, along with some blood vessels or in there and some nerves. And then when we go further inside of our muscle, then we'll notice in these muscle fascicles, we'll have all of these muscle fibers, these nerve cells, and then we wrap each individual, uh, not nerve cell, these muscle cells, each individual muscle cell is gonna be wrapped up in the endomyosin. And so right, very similar to what we saw in our nervous tissue here. All right, so staying on with the connective tissues, there's a couple other types of connective tissue that are gonna be involved in skeletal muscle. Well, what is skeletal muscle attached to? Right? Normally it's going to attach to bone. Well, what allows it to attach to bone? Well, tendons. Tendons attach muscle to bone. Right? So a tendon is going to be like a cord-like structure. And of course, we learned back in chapter five, it's made up of dense regular connective tissue. And it'll attach muscle primarily to bone, but also to skin or, or maybe another muscle. And the tendon is made up of those three connective tissue layers that we just talked about. And then if you want to talk about a flat tendon, we call that an apineurosis, thin, flattened sheet. Again, it's dense connective tissue, and it too is made up of those three connective tissue layers. 
Now, when we have our muscle, we've got another layer that surrounds the, uh, the, our, our whole muscle. And that is referred to as deep fascia. So if you've ever had to do gross dissection and you're trying to separate muscles from one another, okay, what helps to separate muscles from one another is this deep fascia. And that deep fascia, because again, we don't want muscles, all right, to interfere with the operation of neighboring muscles. And this is one of the tissues that helps with that, okay? So our deep fascia is also a dense irregular connective tissue. And it will find it superficial to the outermost connective tissue, the three connective tissues that we were discussing outside the epimyosin. And then way back in chapter six, we were talking about the integument. And when we were talking about the layer underneath our integument, right, that was our hypodermis or um, the subcutaneous layer. Well, we all, I didn't really mention this too much, but we also will refer to that layer as the superficial fascia. And it's both made up of areolar and adipose connective tissue. So normally when you're dissecting uh, a cadaver and you peel back the skin, you're going to be left with, especially if it's an older individual, usually a little bit more adipose tissue. So when you're down in that area and you're, and you're dissecting through the adipose tissue, right, you know that you're at that point in the superficial fascia. And this separates our muscles from our integument system. Okay? Muscle is highly vascularized, has quite a few blood vessels, which makes sense because right, this tissue right, is going to undergo a lot of work. And so it needs nutrients right, for fuel, but also it needs a way to get rid of our um, wastes. So we need to have an extensive uh, vascular system uh, that goes to this tissue. And of course, right, we're gonna innovate uh, this tissue right, by somatic neurons. Right, if you remember from uh, lab class, we discussed somatic neurons. Somatic neurons are the type of neurons that you can voluntarily control, specifically somatic motor neurons. And that's the type of neuron that's going to innervate our skeletal muscle. So we can have voluntary control over the contractions. So those motor neurons, the somatic motor neurons are gonna synapse, all right? at what we call the neuromuscular junction. You should be familiar with that. We'll get into that later on, and we'll talk to you about what the neuromuscular junction actually is. So what are the locations of the endomyosin, the perimyosin, and the epimyosin? Okay, our epimyosin is the outermost layer, surrounds the entirety of the whole skeletal muscle, and it provides protection. All right, the perimyosin is gonna wrap around the muscle fascicles, which are those bundles of individual muscle fibers, okay? And we're gonna see quite a bit of blood vessels and nerves there. And then the endomyosin is the innermost layer and that surrounds each individual muscle fiber, or it allows for the electrical insulation of those tissues there. All right, so of course, in this chapter, there's gonna be some vocabulary that we need to learn. So now I wanna talk about some of the vocabulary and you know pretty much most of it, but when we're talking about muscle tissue, we change some of the names for certain structures. So we're gonna dive down into the microscopic anatomy now. So we're getting really, really small. So when we're talking about our muscle fiber or our muscle cell, remember some of the characteristics of skeletal muscle cells. They're long, they're elongated cells, they're multinucleated and they're striated. So when we're dealing with a muscle cell, Okay, we change the name of our cytoplasm. Remember the cytoplasm? That's what's inside the plasma membrane and outside of the nucleus. Okay, so we don't call it the cytoplasm anymore when we're talking about a uh, muscle cell. We call it sarcoplasm. Here in the sarcoplasm, this is a huge concept. Yes, we'll have our regular organelles, mitochondria, all right, we'll have uh, different types of, of uh, we'll have endoplasmic reticulum, we'll have um, lysosomes, all the stuff that you would normally see inside a cell. But in addition to that, in addition to that, you will have our contractile proteins. And there's some other structures that we'll get into, but the contractile proteins 
are the actin and myosin. Okay, they're these uh, protein filaments that we're going to discuss here shortly. Okay, but that's what we're going to see in the sarcoplasm. Okay, that means it's outside of the nucleus, but inside of the plasma membrane here. All right, so I mentioned this before that, yes, our muscle cells are multinucleated. And the reason for that is when you are developing as an embryo and going through your fetal development, you have these cells called myoblasts, myo being muscle, and these cells will fuse together. And that's what happens. That's why you'll have these long muscle cells having many nuclei. Because at one point, they used to be individual cells that just all fused together. Now, not all of them will fuse. Some won't. And the ones that don't, okay, they will form what we call satellite cells, which is good to have because there are support cells. So if there's damage to the muscle fibers, all right, it's these satellite cells that will help to repair those muscle fibers. So we come to our next term here, the sarcolemma. That's our plasma membrane. Okay, so I will remember in the neuron, we, the, we call the, the, the plasma membrane of the axon, we call that the axolemma, okay? Well, in our muscle cell, we're gonna call it the sarcolemma. So in our sarcolemma, we are going to see a structure called a T-tubule. And that stands for transverse tubules. And basically, I'm, not, I'm sure that I'm not the only person that's ever done this, but when you let the water out of your tub and it starts to get near the bottom, okay, as the water is going out of the tub, you might notice around the drain a little whirlpool starting to form. When I was a kid, I was fascinated by it. I thought it was the coolest thing, okay? That's what these T tubules, to me, look like, all right? These little whirlpool-like structures. So here's your sarcolemma, and then it has these invaginations all throughout, all right, the plasma membrane. They're all over the place. I'll show you pictures, okay? So along the sarcolemma, the plasma membrane, and its T tubules, we're going to see voltage-gated ion channels. Oh, well, we're familiar with those already. We kind of understand how those work, I hope. All right, our voltage-gated ion channels are going to be a channel right, that is normally closed until a stimulus opens it up. And in this case, if it's voltage-gated, we know what the stimulus needs to be. We need to have a change in our, pla our, our, our um, membrane potential. And that's what the, uh, our, our stimulus will be. It'll be a change in the voltage there. And then when that gate opens up, it's going to allow a specific type of charged particle, an ion, to move across the plasma membrane. And when that occurs, right, we'll eventually create an electrical signal that's going to travel along the sarcolemma, much like an action potential traveled along the axolemma in the axon. So you already know this concept here. So I'll go into it in, in, in detail on how it pertains to muscle. All right, but I have to add in this new player, and that's the T-tubule. And these T-tubules, like I said, are these invaginations that extend into the cell, and they have a new type of transport protein inside of them. And they're called voltage-sensitive calcium channels. And so when these action potentials hit these voltage-sensitive calcium channels, it'll trigger these voltage-sensitive calcium channels to open up our gated calcium channels and it will allow calcium right, to move from one place to another. Right? And we'll talk about that. So here is all right, the formation of our skeletal muscle cells. So we start off with all these myoblasts and they fuse together. And eventually they'll form one long cell. And so those cells will retain the nuclei. And some of those myoblasts right, will remain undifferentiated. They will not differentiate into all right, a muscle fiber. And so they'll hang outside and help to support the muscle cell. Okay, it's good to have. So here you're seeing a picture, all right? So you can see here, if I zoom in, here's our full muscle, okay? Here's our fascicle, and now here's one individual muscle fiber. So this is one muscle cell here, but you notice it has all these 
tubes inside. And we'll get into that in a second here, right? We're gonna get, we're gonna go from big to smaller to smaller to smaller. So right now we're at our individual skeletal muscle cell. We've seen this before in chapter four, five, excuse me. So you can see that we've wrapped our muscle cell, okay, with our sarcolemma. Here's the plasma membrane. And we have all these holes in the, our plasma membrane. And those holes are opening to the T tubules. Okay, like I said, think of that little whirlpool in your, in your tub, okay? Those are the T tubules there. And I'll get into more detail about where those are and whatnot. And if you also notice, okay, these muscle cells here have these long co uh, um, columns or tubes here. These are called myofibrils. Myofibrils. We'll get into the discussion a little bit more about what a myofibril is here in a second. But basically, these myofibrils are going to contain our contractile proteins or the myofilaments as, as we call them. Now, if you look here, inside of our muscle cell, we'll have some mitochondria, we've got a nucleus here, all right? And then you can see, well, it's tough to see, but you have your sarcoplasm, okay? That goo that sits around here. And inside the sarcoplasm, you have all these myofibrils. All right, so let's look closer at what a myofibril is. Here you go. Here's your myofibril, right? And it's made up of these structures. This is the functional unit of our muscle cell. It's called a sarcomere. We'll talk more in detail about what a sarcomere is. But basically, right, a myofibril is we've just taken one sarcomere and stacked it on top of the one, on top of the next, on top of the next. So it's basically a bunch of sarcomeres just placed end to end. And so we'll talk about what a sarcomere here is in a little bit. And then what we've done is we've wrapped up our myofibril in this structure here called the sarcoplasmic reticulum. So basically, the best way to describe what a sarcoplasmic reticulum is to you folks is if I'm normally when I do this in the classroom, it's much easier to demonstrate it. But it is going to be like if you were wearing a long sleeve shirt, okay, uh, uh, and the shirt represents the sarcoplasmic reticulum. Your arm will represent the myofibril. So the sarcoplasmic reticulum is on the outside of the myofibril. And it's just this uh, tubular network with some other structures here, which we'll get into in a moment here. I'm going to come back and forth to this. All right, so here you can see, here's our sarcolemma right here. That's our plasma membrane. And then you can see here, there's the opening to the T-tubule. And all throughout our sarcolemma, we're going to have voltage-gated ion channels all throughout. And you'll even see some of those down here into, in the T-tubule. And then we have a new, whoops, my bad. Then we have a new structure called the voltage-sensitive calcium channel which is attached onto what we call our calcium release channels. So when this channel is triggered to, to open, it will trigger the opening of this channel, the calcium release channel, and that will release calcium that was trapped inside of our sarcoplasmic reticulum. It will release calcium out into the sarcoplasm. Again, don't worry, I'm gonna break this down to you. I'm just kind of giving you a general overall view. So we've seen some of these channels in the neuron, the voltage-gated sodium channel, the voltage-gated potassium channel. So those are gonna operate pretty much the same as what we saw in the neuron. Okay. All right, so let's continue on. Well, let me get some of this vocabulary out of the way and then we'll start to get into the good stuff here. All right, so our myofibrils, all right? Those myofibrils are these guys right here. Here's your myofibril, that fellow. Okay, so each individual muscle fiber, which is our muscle cell, is composed of thousands of myofibrils, okay? 
And so we'll see that those myofibrils are enclosed or surrounded by that sarcoplasmic reticulum, that shirt sleeve structure that I was telling you about. All right, we saw you know, a structure in, in chapter four called the endoplasmic reticulum. So the sarcoplasmic reticulum is very similar to the endoplasmic reticulum. All right, the endoplasmic reticulum was a tubular network. Same thing. All right, our sarcoplasmic reticulum is going to be a tubular network. So associated with the sarcoplasmic reticulum is a structure called the terminal cisterna. Now, let's go back to that shirt sleeve um, analogy that I was giving you. Right, so we have our long sleeve shirt. Okay, and at the end, all right, a lot of my long sleeve shirts, especially if they're a dress shirt, have a cuff on the end or a hem, shirt hem. That's what the terminal cisterna is. It's a blind sac that is going to sit at the end of the sarcoplasmic reticulum. And this is where we are going to see all right, a storage facility or a reservoir of our calcium ions. From this point on, you're going to have a new appreciation for calcium. But I want you to think of calcium like a princess that is imprisoned in a tower somewhere. The princess is locked away in the tower, and we need to get that princess out of the tower. Because if we can get the princess out of the tower, we can have our muscle contraction. But so long as the princess is stuck inside of that tower, we cannot have a muscle contraction. And so that tower is the terminal cisterna. All right. So in the terminal cisterna, we are going to see two calcium storage proteins called calmodulin and calsequestrin. Cal sequestrin is easy to remember because if you sequester a jury, it means you're going to keep them in a room somewhere. All right. So cal sequestrin is going to keep calcium in the terminal cisterna. And so what we'll see is you'll have some free calcium, but you'll also have some calcium that binds on to these storage proteins. And they all hang out in the terminal cisterna. All right. Intermixed with the terminal cisterna is going to be that T tubule. So I'm going to show you a picture called the triad here, in which you have two terminal cisterna and one T tubule sandwiched in between. So you're probably thinking, what the heck is that man talking about? Well, that's this right here. Okay, so here's our sarcoplasmic reticulum. It's this tubular network. But you'll notice at the very end, all right, of this sarcoplasmic reticulum, you have this blue tube there. That is the terminal cisterna. Then you've got another, then you've got a green tube, then you've got another blue tube. Okay, so that other blue, that second blue tube is the sarco, uh, excuse me, is the terminal cisterna, you know, next door. And in between those two terminal cisterna is the T tubule. All right, so the T tubule is going to be sandwiched in between two terminal cisterna. So we refer to that configuration as the triad. Okay, more on that in a moment. All right, so once the action potential, that electrical charge, gets down into the T tubule, it's going to trigger, right? the opening of those voltage sensitive calcium channels, which will then activate the calcium release channels to open up and release calcium into the sarcoplasm. So it now releases the princess out of the tower and into the sarcoplasm. Guess what's waiting in the sarcoplasm? These guys, the myofilaments, our protein filaments, our actin and myosin, that's what's going to cause the muscle contraction. Okay. That's our goal. So here you can see, here's a triad here. All right, zoom in a little bit. So here's our, volt, our, our T-tubule. So the electrical signal comes down the T-tubule. It'll 
trigger the voltage sensitive calcium channel to open up and that will then cause the calcium release channel to allow calcium to leave the terminal cisterna and go out here into the sarcoplasm. And we also will see, all right, on our terminal cisterna and the sarcoplasmic reticulum, our calcium pumps. Because when the party's over, it's time to clean up, okay? So calcium being released, all right, is like a party. So we have to clean up the party so the calcium uh, ion pumps will pump calcium back into our sarcoplasmic reticulum terminal cisterna here. All right, so our goal is to get calcium in a resting muscle out of the terminal cisterna and into the sarcoplasm because that will then trigger a muscle contraction. And we'll go through all those mechanics later on. All right, but for right now, I need you to know the players. So we have our T tubule, which our action potential will travel down. And then once it arrives at a voltage sensitive calcium channel, it'll trigger that to open up and that will release calcium out of the terminal cisterna and into the sarcoplasm. So that leads me into our next structure, the myofilaments. Those are what we call our contractile proteins. And so there's two types. All right, there's thick and thin filaments or myosin and actin. So let's talk a little bit about these right now. So we'll start off with the myosin, the thick filaments. All right, the myosin, I want you to think of these long strands. It's like a rope, okay? So you have this rope that's kind of twisted around itself. All right, that's a horrible drawing. And you'll have at one end, all right, these strands and then you'll have at the other end, all right, these, I'm not even, that's awful. I apologize. I shouldn't have subjected you folks to that. <laughs> all right. So anyways, you'll have uh, these long strands, which we call the tails. And then at the end, on one end of the tail uh, uh, of that long strand, you'll have what we call a, a globular head or just the head. And it's the head that has the binding site. This is important. All right for the actin, which is the thin filament. Also on our head, we'll see another site for where ATP, remember that's our energy currency for the cell, right? that's where it's, it will attach onto that myosin head. And when it does, we'll see it split into ADP and phosphate, but there's an enzyme there called ATPase. Okay, so we just take the three letters ATP and then add ASE to it. That's ATPase, which is the enzyme okay, that is going to cause ATP, excuse me, to split into ADP and phosphate. Okay, so I'll show you a picture here real quick. All right, so here again, here's our muscle fiber made up of all these myofibrils. And so we pulled out the myofibrils and inside each individual myofibril, we'll see our myofilaments, which are thick and thin filaments. So here's our myosin molecule. Here's that tail. And then you'll see the globular heads here. And then on the head, you'll have two binding sites. One for actin, that's the thin filament, and the other for ATP. You know that. So here you can see all right, our thick filament. So you have all these globular heads hanging off there. All right, so that's the thick filament. Our thin filament, right, our thin filament, I want you to think of, of the thin filament as if you were to take two pearl necklaces and twist them around each other. And that's what we see here with our thin filaments. We have these two strands, we twist them around each other. One of those strands is gonna be what we call F-actin, all right, and then the other one is going to be G-actin. It's the G-actin that has the myosin binding site. All right, now we're going to introduce two other types of proteins, and these proteins are important. First, they're what we call regulatory proteins. So these proteins are going to control, all right, if a contraction happens or not. So we have 
tropomyosin and troponin. Now the tropomyosin, think of it like a rope. And tropomyosin is going to cover the myosin binding site right, on the actin. It is, okay? So when a muscle's not doing anything, when it's at rest, when it's not contracting, tropomyosin is going to be covering the myosin binding site. So it can't contract because it covers up that binding site where, act, uh, where myosin can attach onto actin so we can get what we call a cross bridge. I'll talk more about that soon. The other protein is called troponin. Remember what I said just a few moments ago. Our goal is to get calcium out of the tower and we need it to get into the sarcoplasm because in the sarcoplasm, that's where our myofilaments are, those contractile proteins. And so that calcium is going to bind onto one of those regulatory proteins and it's going to shift the other regulatory protein off of the binding site. So when that happens, now actin and myosin can bind to one another. So tropomyosin blocks the binding sites. Troponin sits on top of tropomyosin. And so when calcium rolls in, it will bind onto troponin, and that causes troponin to pull tropomyosin off of the myosin binding site so myosin and actin can bind onto one of those. I'll show you what I'm talking about. All right, so down here you can see, here's our thin filament. So like I said, it looks like two pearl necklaces that we just kind of twisted over one another. All right, so you can see we have our um, G actin and our F actin. And so, on the F-actin, you've got your myosin binding site. In a non-contracting muscle, it's covered by this rope. And this green rope is one of our regulatory proteins called tropomyosin. So tropomyosin is blocking that binding site. And then what sits on top of the tropomyosin is our troponin. It's a globular protein. And it's got a binding site, like a little cup here, for calcium. So when calcium is released into the sarcoplasm, it attaches or binds right onto uh, the troponin, and that causes the troponin to pull the tropomyosin off of our myosin binding site. And that allows myosin right here, these globular heads, to attach onto the binding site. This is where that video comes in really, really handy. So I will be sending that out to you folks as soon as I can. Okay. So we talked about a couple of the different structures in our muscles. And I will be going over this stuff more in detail throughout the rest of this chapter, okay? But right now, I kind of want to switch gears and talk about the sarcomere. If you don't remember what a sarcomere is, this is a sarcomere right here at the bottom of your page. Right. In our myofibrils, okay, you'll have these structures. They're called a sarcomere. This is the functional unit. This is where a muscle contraction occurs and makes the muscle shorter. So we're now going to talk about the organization of a sarcomere, which are part of these myofibrils. So when we talk about a sarcomere, right, what we're referring to is all those myofilaments and how we just stack them from end to end to end. And they're just these repeating uh, uh, myofilament or uh, uh, structures. And in short muscles, you'll have a smaller number of these uh, sarcomeres um, for, for the length. In a longer muscle, you'll have many more. All right, but basically, all right, what a sarcomere is, is these overlapping thick and thin filaments. That's it. And so on one end, you have a structure called the Z-disc. And at the other end, you have another structure called the Z-disc. And that's how we're able to determine 
all right, where one sarcomere begins and where the other one ends. And so what we'll see on these Z discs is one, this is where we're gonna anchor our thin filaments. So depending on where there's overlap between thick and thin filaments, will determine you know, the striations that we see in our skeletal muscles and in our cardiac muscles, because we have a very similar type of situation with the cardiac muscle. But for right now, we're talking about skeletal muscle. So in the darker uh, striated areas of the muscle, right, we'll see more of an overlap between the thick and thin filaments. If it's lighter there, then there's less overlap going on. Right? We'll talk about the I bands and the A bands here in a moment. All right, so I bands. And we, I always think of the letter I is pretty thin. So when we're looking at a sarcomere, right, the I bands are going to be those areas that appear lighter. And that's because you only have thin filaments. And look, when we're comparing thick and thin, I mean, it's all relative in this picture here. But this all right, filament looks thicker than this one. So when we shine light through it, more light will come through the thin filament, and that's going to be our eye band. At the center of the eye band right, is going to be a structure that we just talked about, the Z-disc. So when your muscle contracts, think of the Z-disc as the, as the anchoring point. So when the muscle contracts, all right, the eye band will get smaller and smaller and smaller uh, the more the muscle contracts, and it's possible when you contract the muscle as much as it can possibly contract, the eye band can completely disappear altogether. All right, so the eye band, its uh, um, length will change. The A band does not change in length when we contract the muscle. And that means uh, muscle, by the way. So the A band is gonna be the dark appearing region. And that's because we do get an overlap between the thick and thin filaments. Okay, so we'll see in our A bands, all right, an overlapping of thick and thin filaments, so it'll appear more dark. And so we have these structures called the M line, which I'll talk about here in a moment. That's going to be where the thick filaments anchor, right, and that's going to be in the center there. And then we have this area called the H zone. All right, but the, think of the A band, all right, is the middle or the central region of the, our sarcomere. All right, that leads me to the H zone and the M line. Okay, so the H zone is going to be found here in the A band, and it's in the center of the A band. This is where we're going to see just thick filaments. No thin filament overlap is going to occur here, but, but the H zone its uh, uh, length will change with muscle contraction and it can completely disappear again when we see maximal muscle contraction. All right, and then finally, the M line is going to be the center portion, like I said before, where the thick filaments were our myosin anchors. To easy to remember, M line, myosin both begin with the same letter. So let's zoom in here. All right, so here you can see our sarcomere. This is a Z disc. So from one Z disc to the next is one sarcomere. At the center of the sarcomere, you have your M line. How I memorized that was M middle. Okay, the M line is in the middle of the sarcomere. The M line is also where the thick filaments anchor themselves to. The thin filaments anchor themselves to the Z disc. Then you have, all right, on either side immediately of the M line, that's the H zone. Okay, the H zone, we don't see thin filaments there. Then just to either side of the H zone, right, you'll see, all right, that's where we'll have our thick and thin filament overlap. That's going to be seen in the A band there. On either side of our Z disc is our I band. Okay, letter I is pretty thin. 
Okay, so the only thing that you're going to see in the I band is going to be the thin filaments, the actin. And so the I band can get smaller and it can possibly disappear during maximal contraction. So now when we're looking at it more, I like this uh, uh, structural uh, uh, picture here because now you can actually see what the heck I'm talking about. <sighs> All right, so here's our sarcomere. Here's our Z-disc on either side. And then what anchors to the Z-disc, here's our thin filaments, thin filaments. Okay, so on either side of the Z-disc, you'll see just the thin filaments. That means we're in the I band. Only thin filaments are gonna be where the I band is. Then at the center of our sarcomere, here's our M line. And our thick filaments are going to anchor themselves to the M line. On either side, immediately to the M line is the H zone. The H zone only has thick filaments in it. But in our A band, which is further out from the M line, okay, you will see some overlap between. This is where we're going to see the overlap between the thick and the thin filaments in the A band. I band, no overlap. H zone, no overlap. Only in the A band will we have overlap between the thick and thin filaments. And then you'll see this kind of springy like structure. All right, that's connectin. That's another protein. It helps with the elasticity of the muscle. We'll talk more about that. All right, so when we're talking about the cross section of our sarcomere. All right, you can see when we do a cross section of the H zone, right, that cross section of the H zone is just where there's thick filaments. We don't see any thin filaments. And then when we look at the cross section of the I band, we're only going to see the thin filaments. We don't see any thick filaments. Where you want to see overlap is in the A band. That's where we'll have thick and thin filament overlap. In which band are there thick filaments only? Remember which letter is really thin? Okay, that would be, um, oh wait, in which, oh, sorry, bad, 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 bad. I was thinking thin, all right. The, it's the I band in which we only have thin filaments. In which band, I gotta start thinking out loud more. In which band are there thick filaments only? That's the H zone with no thin filament overlap. Okay, so a couple other uh, uh, proteins that I wanna talk about are connectin and dystrophin. Now you may have heard of dystrophin before because there's muscular dystrophy, okay? So these are going to be some proteins, all right? Remember I was telling you about the connectin. The connectin is going to contribute to the elasticity. And I like how your book draws it because they draw it like a spring, which is great uh, uh, use of trying to um, uh, get across the fact like a spring is elastic, you know, it stretches and recoils. Well, connectin uh, is similar to that, right? It has elastic like properties here. Okay, so what we'll see is because of its spring-like properties, it helps to stabilize the thick filaments. All right, so if you're ever trying to assess, right, somebody when they're at rest, how, their muscle tension, that's what they're actually assessing, right? How well the connectin, all right, is stabilizing the thick filaments, right, during that relaxation period. Right, dystrophin right, is going to anchor our myofibrils to some of the proteins in the plasma membrane of the sarcolemma. Well, that's good. We need to have some anchoring points here. Helps with stabilization. Problem is, right, uh, in certain genetic diseases, our muscular dystrophy diseases, right, we'll see that this protein has some, uh, um, um, some gen genetic malformations and this can cause irregularities in the actual overall gross anatomy of the muscle itself. Which brings me to muscular dystrophy, right? Genetic disease, also known as a hereditary disease. 
and we'll see degeneration of our skeletal muscle. Now, the most popular one that you hear the one that uh, folks talk about a lot is Duchenne's muscular dystrophy. All right, and in this situation, the dystrophin that we have is either garbage, it's not made correctly, or, or, or there's just not enough of it. And so what will happen is, all right, during muscle contraction, we are literally destroying, all right, our plasma membrane, the sarcolemma. And so what happens is calcium, because remember, all right, calcium, there's a, a large amount, or no, I shouldn't say a large amount, but a considerable amount of calcium outside of the cell. All right, and so what happens is that calcium enters in and it starts to damage all right, our proteins inside the cell. And when we start to damage the proteins, then we start to damage the cell itself. And hence, all right, whatever that cell is going to be used for, in this case, it's a muscle cell. So we'll have problems with some of the functions of the muscle tissue. So what does muscle tissue do? Well, it helps to move the body. Okay, so we'll see some walking problems. We'll start to see muscle atrophy. And then, of course, we'll see all right, some issues with posture. All right, so unfortunately, as of right now, we haven't found a cure for muscular dystrophy. All right, but all right, technology being what it is, it is improving. Okay, but we really don't see these patients living past the third decade of their life, unfortunately. All right, so what else do we find inside of our skeletal muscle cells? Well, I told you mitochondria, the powerhouse of the cell. We need to make sure that this tissue right, has the power that it needs, the energy that it needs for it to undergo its functions. All right, so think of mitochondria as energy producers. And the way that mitochondria produces ATP is with the help of oxygen. If you don't have oxygen, then you're not going to get a lot of ATP, right? And so we need a lot of uh, ATP. So mitochondria is going to make ATP through the process of aerobic cellular respiration or aerobic ATP production. Aerobic means with oxygen. Okay. So think of oxygen as that person that uh, knows the bouncer at the club and can get you into the club because we got to get into the club. Okay? We got to get stuff. And that's how we make energy for the mitochondria. We got to get what we call the energy substrate, which is called pyruvate, inside the mitochondria. Oxygen allows for that to happen. Oxygen brings that what we call the energy substrate, one of the ingredients to make ATP from outside the mitochondria to inside the mitochondria. And then we can make a lot of ATP. If you don't have oxygen, one glucose molecule will give you two ATP. If you have oxygen, then one glucose molecule can give you 32 ATP. That's pretty gosh darn good. So you know, in our, in our blood, we have hemoglobin. And hemoglobin is that protein that carries oxygen in our red blood cells. Well, inside of our muscle cells, we have a protein called myoglobin. And so it is used to store oxygen inside of the cell, which is good because we're gonna need that oxygen for our aerobic ATP production. Uh, I'm having problems remembering, I think it was chapter two, we talked about the different types of metabolism. And so um, one of the things that I did talk about uh, when we were, yeah, it was in chapter two, now that I think about it, when we were talking about uh, the macromolecules, we were discussing glucose, and glucose is a simple sugar. Well, guess what? On a rainy day, okay, your body wants to store glucose, and if you recall, the storage form of glucose is called glycogen, and there's only two tissues in the body in which we are, where we can find glycogen, in the liver and in our skeletal muscle tissue. That's it. So makes sense. We're going to store glycogen inside of our skeletal muscle cells. So when it's needed, we can break it down into glucose and then start to utilize glucose for uh, our, our energy needs. And so that's what happens. We also have another uh, uh, substance called creatine phosphate. And creatine phosphate 
again, if you look here at ATP, stands for adenosine triphosphate. Tri is three, okay? So basically, we have a molecule that has three phosphate molecules attached to it. Well, what creatinine phosphate does is it is going to donate a phosphate group. So you have, say you have some ADP, which is good, all right, but we want ATP. ATP is an awesome energy uh, uh, currency. So what will happen is creatinine phosphate donates its phosphate group to ADP, and it adds that phosphate onto the ADP molecule and it replenishes ATP. We'll get into more detail about that later on. I already talked about myoglobin, okay? Um, blah, 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 uh, binds oxygen and yeah. So what are the primary components of thick and thin filaments? Thick and thin filaments. Thick filaments are composed of myosin. Thin filaments are going to be actin, but also don't forget about our regulatory proteins. Tropomyosin, which is the rope that blocks the myosin binding sites. And then we have troponin, which is that globular cup-like protein that sits on top of trop tropomyosin. And troponin has the calcium binding site. So when calcium binds to troponin, the troponin tugs on tropomyosin and pulls it off of the myosin binding sites on actin, and that will allow myosin and actin to bind to one another so we can cause a muscle contraction. But we get to talk about that later. Oh, good, and I've got time too. So we get now we're gonna get to the fun stuff. Okay, so you heard me talking about all these parts and pieces. Now I'm gonna show you how all this stuff works. Okay, so what I would recommend when you were trying to learn this material is go and memorize. I wish there was an easier way to go about this, but unfortunately there's not. All right, go and memorize all those parts and pieces that I talked about. All right, so you need to know what a sarcolemma is. You need to know what the sarcoplasm is. You need to know what actin is and myosin, tropomyosin, troponin. You gotta learn all that stuff. Because right, then you'll understand what it is that we're gonna be talking about all right, from this point forward. Because now we're gonna talk about all the events that lead up and include a skeletal muscle contraction. So there are three events. There's what we call the excitation, all right, of the skeletal muscle fiber, and this occurs at the neuromuscular junction. Then we have what's called the excitation contraction coupling. That's the second event. And then finally, the third event is the cross bridge cycling which is the actual contraction, right? So believe it or not, the first event is nice because you know this already. Because we already kind of talked about it back in chapter 12. What happens at the terminal end of the neuron on what we call this transmissive segment? We're now going to kind of review and talk about what happens right, at the synaptic knob. And then we're going to kind of continue that story into muscle. All right, so let's first discuss, all right, at that first, so we're gonna start off, this is probably what we're, we're gonna have time to talk about today, is what happens here, all right, at the neuromuscular junction. Now, if you dissect that word neuro and muscular, all right, this is where all right, our motor neuron is going to synapse onto the muscle tissue. So we're gonna discuss all that. So the neuromuscular junction, this is where our motor somatic neuron is going to innervate our muscle tissue. And we're going to see this pretty much at the mid region, right in the middle of our muscle fiber. So there's going to be three structures. There's the synaptic knob. Okay, that, that is the part of the neuron. Then you're going to have the motor end plate. That is the part of our muscle fiber that the synaptic knob is going to come in contact with. And then there's gonna be the space in between both of those uh, structures, which is called the synaptic cleft. We're familiar with all of those things. Okay, so this is review time. And so now you're going to kind of see how we're gonna kind of throw these concepts together. So the synaptic knob, that's that transmissive segment. At the end of the telodendro, we see the expansions of the telodendron, 
That's the synaptic knob. And inside is where we have our neurotransmitter. And the neurotransmitter sits inside those little membrane sacs called synaptic vesicles. Now, up until this point, I just called it neurotransmitter. I never got specific. Well, now we're going to get specific. And the specific neurotransmitter that we're going to discuss is acetylcholine, also known as ACH. Acetylcholine. Also in our synaptic knob, we are going to see, we've already talked about this before, our calcium ion pumps. What is their job? They're going to establish the calcium gradient. Well, what the heck is that? That, that is the fact that there's more calcium outside the cell than inside the cell. Because when calcium, all right, is able to move across the plasma membrane of the cell, where's it going to go? It's going to want to go into the cell. Because remember, it's going to flow down its concentration gradient. Well, how does it get in the cell? No problem. It gets in through transport proteins, specifically voltage-gated calcium channels. So we know how these things work. Our action potential travels down the axon all, right, all the way to the synaptic knob. It triggers the voltage-gated calcium channels to open up. And when they do, calcium flows into the cell. It goes from an area of high concentration, which is outside the cell, to an area of low concentration, which is inside the cell. All right, so then what happens? Well, I'll tell you what happens. All right, calcium then, as it enters into the cell, it's going to move in, into the cell and surround those synaptic vesicles. And as it surrounds the synaptic vesicles, it causes those synaptic vesicles to become positive. Well, that triggers, all right, the synaptic vesicles to move towards the um, synaptic cleft. And as they do, they um, fuse with the plasma membrane and release acetylcholine into the synaptic cleft through the process of exocytosis. Exocytosis. So you'll see, all right, that when an action potential comes down and releases acetylcholine, all right, that's roughly, all right, several hundred vesicles will move towards the synaptic cleft and spill the neurotransmitter acetylcholine into the synaptic cleft. And that neurotransmitter will then diffuse across that synaptic cleft and migrate towards this fella here, the motor end plate. And so the motor end plate is going to be that area on the muscle fiber and which, all right, uh, is in close proximity to the synaptic knob. And it, it is a specific area that has all these different folds. So for the most part, the sarcolemma is smooth, and then we get down to the motor end plate, and then we'll see all these little folds here, and then it gets smooth again. And the synaptic knob will sit right above that. Okay, so in the motor end plate, right, we have these acetylcholine receptors. Again, these are specialized plasma membranes, excuse me, uh, protein, uh, uh, um, transport proteins. Golly, I can't talk today. And so what will happen is the acetylcholine will bind on to the acetylcholine receptors, and that will trigger the opening of these transport proteins. And it'll allow sodium to enter into the cell and potassium to exit. Because, all right, we still will see a similar type of concept here in regards to the presence of voltage gated sodium channels, voltage gated potassium channels between our skeletal muscle tissue and the neuron. Okay, so this is where we'll see, all right, the opening of those channels, and then we'll change the plasma membrane. We'll talk about the membrane potential here in a moment. All right, our synaptic cleft, right? That's our fluid filled space. Okay, that's what's going to be in between our synaptic knob and the motor end plate. And what's very important is this enzyme right here, acetylcholine esterase. Acetylcholine esterase is going to be the enzyme that breaks down acetylcholine. Because remember, we're having a party and our neurotransmitter, all right? is like the confetti after New Year's Eve, it's all over the place in the synaptic cleft, right? We gotta clean that up. 
And so acetylcholine esterase does that. It breaks down acetylcholine all right, into uh, acetate in, in acetate molecule and a choline molecule. More, uh, um, more detail to come soon when we talk about uh, neurotransmitters, okay? All right, so here you can see, it's a beautiful picture. If you understand this picture, you're really going to do well with this part of um, contraction. So here you can see, uh, here's our synaptic knob. Right, the axe potential will trigger the opening of the voltage-gated calcium channel. Calcium will enter in. It'll bind on to the synaptic vesicles. Then that synaptic vesicle will migrate towards the plasma membrane here, fuse with the uh, plasma membrane, and release acetylcholine into the synaptic cleft via exocytosis. So your acetylcholine will diffuse across the cleft. It'll bind onto the acetylcholine receptors that are sitting on these um, membrane, uh, these transport proteins, these membrane transport proteins. And some of those will be volt, uh, not voltage gated, but chemically gated sodium channels and chemically gated potassium channels. And so depending on which type of channel, okay, that will allow a specific type of ion to move across that channel. All right, this picture here will show you everything that I just talked about, all right? I've already talked about all this. All right, so that brings me to myasthenia gravis, which is another condition. I don't know if anyone's ever heard about it. Of course, it's an autoimmune disease, which means it's going to be seen more so in women. But in this type of, uh, of condition or disease, I should say, we have antibodies okay, which are going to attack our own acetylcholine receptors at the motor end plate there. And what it'll do is it will start to destroy these acetylcholine receptors, all right, through endocytosis. And because we have fewer acetylcholine receptors, that means, all right, we're, what we're going to have, it's going to make it more difficult to stimulate the muscle right, to elicit a contraction. So in these patients, you'll see people getting tired quicker, and overall, they'll just be weaker. So usually we'll see this in some of our more fine motor control muscles, so eye muscles and facial muscles uh, will be affected first. And then eventually, uh, the larger muscle group will uh, be affected, so these patients will have issues with swallowing, and then we get to the real large muscle groups, they'll have uh, limb weakness. All right, there's an easy way to help deal with this. Uh, just give these folks, I shouldn't say an easy way, but a way to help manage this condition is give folks a, an acetylcholine esterase inhibitor, which is a, a drug that will prevent a, a acetylcholine esterase from breaking down acetylcholine. So the acetylcholine will stay in the synaptic cleft longer and it'll help to stimulate the motor end plate more so we can actually get a, a much more effective contraction. So what triggers the binding all right, uh, of the synaptic vesicles to the synaptic knob membrane to cause exocytosis of the acetylcholine? That's our action potential. It comes down, stimulates the opening of the voltage-gated calcium channels. And then the calcium floods in and it will attach to the synaptic vesicles and then trigger the release of acetylcholine into the synaptic cleft through exocytosis. Ooh, this is a good place to stop. I don't want to, but plus we're kind of running over here a little bit. So let's stop here. And what we'll do is,